the record reflect that all board members are present. And with that, we'll go into this briefing from John on the uh, how we're going to open the school. Uh, yeah, for me, I need mean, somebody to fill the boots. I don't have a lot of text. There we go. I picked it up some on the machine. Thank you for coming tonight. We look forward to hearing from you. What I put up tonight is not the whole package. Number one is by all means a draft. It's to help you to understand, and we're looking for feedback from you and the board on this. Uh, we do have an action uh, committee uh, forming, trying to find time when we can meet. And that's going to be very important for the people that are on it. And uh, some might not be able to meet at one time or another, and we can do different things to help them with that um, along the way. So uh, you know, if you go to the next slide, please. Um, you've heard me, if you've listened at all, or you've seen anything at all, there are three scenarios, but I don't want to assume, thank you, So, By the way, before I get started, uh, David has worked so we can record this and put it out. This is our first attempt uh, using the portable mic system, and uh, I thank him so much because he had other plans for tonight, he gave him up to be here tonight. And as a matter of fact, uh, he had the leave and then come back and get this to work. So hopefully we get uh, get this recorded to share out with other people. Anyway, the first one's in person, but we also have to have what I'd like to call not distance learning, because I don't know about you, in some cases that looks kind of a bad case in, in people's mouths, but I want you to understand, people work hard to put that together five days here. It's like, put it together, let's get it out, let's go. And uh, I know you do what you've been practicing, and that, that's where it is. I know uh, so many of our people work very hard to put extra hours into that. So this time, we've got more direction on get into that, with what that distance learning looks like, and we're supposed to blend it. What I mean by blending, I mean that we have to pull in other resources. We have to make more communication with our students. And I'll get another slide on that. The hybrid isn't 50% of the kids in school, it's 50% of the capacity. So when you look at that, think about that. Uh, the, file mark, the fire marshal has a, uh, a plan to count up how many can be in a room. So first of all, we take that number and we divide it in half. Second part to that is what, they, uh, what we do is we have to do social distancing. That's a must. Uh, in that plan. They understand in person, you might not be able to for many different reasons, okay? And then uh, lower grades, if we possibly can uh, give, uh, fill a task, it's something that uh, I'm in regular meetings with other, other superintendents in Region 5 explicitly, and many different things are shared. Uh, I have a few more of those I forgot to grab because the doors could be unlocked. And then uh, distance blended learning, that's what it is. And we will do everything we can to make contact with it. That's, that's something we got from the state. Questions on that or need more clarification? Comments? Would you go to the next slide, please? The protocol for which scenario? How did we get to where we are? I actually had calls and emails saying, but what I want to know, are we starting in person? I said, I can't tell you. Um, it's recommended we don't even look until the week of the 24th. Uh, some people I know have put that out there, but I don't want to put something out and then all of a sudden, well, why did you change it? It has to do with these protocols we have to follow. And if you've ever seen Russian dolls, that's kind of what this is. And I illustrated where the ones that are pulled apart. You pull them apart, they all fit inside one. And um, the big one would represent what the, the county or the state is. The yellow one there on the lower right would be the county. Then we go to the, the regional one and inside is us. We're, we're the small one. But I like how they set out the plan in that we have an awful lot of input at what's going on. And what's going on in our district, and that means all parts of the district. We have some people that, that would be in Benton County, 
and let's say they have an outbreak there, well, that doesn't mean that, that we automatically close it down. What it means that's taken into consideration. And we, we, I mean, don't go too far in Warren County, right? And what's going on here? What's going on with the students we have here? If everything's clean and good, there's no problem. But we have to go through the process. The county feeds in those numbers for us. They have a constant dashboard hooked up with uh, the Minnesota Department of Health, and then it breaks down into uh, the regional, uh, the region response team. For us, that's from Staples, that uh, is SourceWell. I think SourceWell for all the good work. They've already got the team in place. Now they're waiting for more direction in what to do. And if you read, the state's providing cloth masks for all students, and they're giving us three uh, um, throwaway masks for every student, and then we purchased a bunch too. Uh, but anyway, they'll distribute that. They will look at the data and sort it out with the county. And then they present it to us and give us that. If our numbers get low, it looks like we might have to change. Then we take that data and start to pick it apart and help uh, the region response team figure it out with our own uh, royalty response team. And that, that is a, a axillary that comes off of the larger committee that we'll be working with. Questions, comments, yes. Where do we find that data that per 10,000 uh, cases per 10,000. What what data set are we going to use? I, I don't have that with me right now. Uh, they sent it out, but I didn't even, they sent out the original one to me. I don't have the place to go get it, but it's done by every single county in the state. There probably needs to be a link <coughs> of the data that we're going to use on our website because people are going to follow that. I agree. Yeah. How many, uh, what is the population of Morrison County? Population of Morrison County is about 39 something thousand. Um, if you look on the Morrison County webpage and then you find the uh, COVID 19 part and you look under schools, they'll give you the data that the county has. Um, for, I'll, I'll read it, I have it right here. Um, it's a 14 day case rate range. And, uh, so as of July 30th, that's the latest one that they have. Morrison County has uh, 3.95 cases per 10,000 people. So according to their recommendation here, zero to nine cases. 10,000 people can have school you have to do the distancing and the mask work. You can have school up to zero to nine. And then once you get 10 cases per 10,000 in that 14 day uh, look back, then you have to adjust into a different model. Um, just a couple other things I noticed on that website. Zero kids have died in Minnesota between six and 19 years old from it. And, uh, it's, uh, I don't know, I haven't, this, I'm just like you guys, I haven't heard the briefs at all. But I can imagine there'll be some people that are scared to send their kid to school, uh, regardless of the numbers. And uh, hopefully later on in the brief, Yes, absolutely. Um, and that is something. One second. Yes, absolutely. Ellie, do you have something? Um, I do. I was wondering, and I actually called the MSBA both today and the uh, Department of Education, and I haven't received a call back yet. But I do have the question if they are going to differentiate, differentiate on um, like kids who are people who are actually hospitalized dying you know well that way out our i mean if there's kids that have it i mean it's a virus that's not going to go away because usually i think and i could be off a little bit but i did talk to uh, a 
a nurse that we've had here, she's a client, whatever, a few years ago, and I think it was 20% of your students would have to be positive for influenza before we would actually close down. Are they comparing this with influenza at all, or? Uh, no, it, actually, uh, when I handed out, there's a chart in there. Uh, they, they looked at the COVID test for the case, as far as I know. And uh, what Noel said it is right, and what you're talking about, we still don't have yet, you know, this is kind of new. And, and people want to know that some of that information is not yet. And are they, I mean, are they taking into consideration that these tests are less than 50% accurate? It depends on which test you're talking about, but that's what they'll go by. Uh, it goes back to the uh, county and the information they have is breaking it down. One of the things, uh, though, that they have put out is we go to the, the uh, more dense county and look at that. We don't go to where the biggest amount of population is. That was a question I was in on a uh, thing on Saturday morning, and that was a huge question came up. We still don't have that full direction. But that's where I think it's so important to go to what's happening here. And what, what's happening in Royalton with, with the breakup. Uh, right now, they just said the cases, which are being tested. Somebody else? Yes. So, does that mean that you're basically in Royalton? Yes, that does. And that, um, there are protocols for handling that as well. And that's something um, that has changed since everything originally came up. That's one of the problems. Um, I, I shared this with a few people uh, already. For example, there was a, a missed talk at the press briefing. They said, hey, if you, if you don't want to work in the school, uh, you have the option to do it uh, distantly. Well, no, that's not true. That's the second time that's happened. And you, you know, the answer is, and you will get paid. There are certain steps. I use that for an example. That was already out a few hours after uh, that was said. That was brought to us, and that's constantly what's happening. People have questions, just like Ellie had. Good question, um, and I'm not going to say anything I don't know or I have not read yet. It's a continuous reading thing, but we'll find out as time goes on. Um, that's all I can say right now. But I don't have that answer. I just think though that it's important that we're all looking at the same data set, especially with. If, if there's going to be a lot of people watching this 14-day turnaround, there's going to be websites coming up all over that they're going to have it. And they, you know, we all have to be looking at the same data set. We can't, one, be looking at one that's two days ahead or two days behind where we should be using the government one. Yeah, I, I, Go so ahead. I'd like to clarify that number I read you, 3.95 per 10,000. Morrison County. That's not Royalton School District. And the data that will be used is hidden from us because SourceWell is going to be taking, uh, you know, like Little Falls School District may be higher than 10, we may be lower than 10, both in Morrison County, but part of us is ultimately too. So the data from the county website is not the data that SourceWell is going to be using. And we don't have access to that other than through the school. So we can get from one to that information. One more question. Yeah. Um, these numbers on here, like the learning model parameters, is that a recommendation by SourceWell or is this an actual? I mean, can you? adjust it to your district, or is this actually something that we have to do? Uh, I, bet I have that on the sheet. I'll, get, I'll talk about that when we get to our okay. Great. Well, let's, let's continue on with your presentation. Yeah. Some of these questions will get answered. Well, some of them will, some of them will. And uh, what Noel said was right on. It, it, I go back. We're the little one in there, but we get that information. We're smaller. We're not everybody. And that becomes so important. Next one, please. 
So that's what I tried to show you here is every step, how many information, local numbers, region rapid response team, local rapid response team. And then we all sit down and kind of say, we talk about it in our response team. And we look at what is actually happening in our school district because the county doesn't know everybody that's with us. They know who's in our school district. My guess is that this will probably buy address, but that's not necessarily fact, and that's what's important. Next slide, please. So this is what uh, Ellie just had, and you have that handout as well, and it's in both handouts for you. This is what uh, has come from the state based on different things. And over to the nine, zero to nine, it's for royalty here. Even that, you know, they said they would fudge some with it. And I shouldn't say fudge. They said where that's at, they could play with that some. So let's say we're not at a, a, a nine. We might even be at a 10. Well, what is that 10? What does it represent? How many people are coming off and how many people are on? So those are all things we have to look at locally in the response teams that the county will look at. Did I answer your question, Ellen? Yeah, because I was just thinking, I mean, if you have a kid test positive and it counts as one student, but there's no symptoms, I mean, or no one's being hospitalized or dying, yeah. I mean, I guess, I, I mean, and this is just my opinion, but I mean, I would think that would take into play your numbers. Yeah, it, it absolutely will. And like we said, there are some protocols I, I want to share those with you, but I don't have them now because they've been changed. Even the testing has changed. I think these protocols will change too, because as we get into it, we're going to find out when their hotspot comes, the testing is going to ramp up, and as the testing ramp up, the cases are going to ramp up to self-employed prophecy. So they're going to have to use percentages at some point. But yeah, yeah. Uh, and not only that, it doesn't account for people that are coming off. For example. Uh, one that I know about, the parent immediately, I said this the other night, immediately did what they're supposed to, what the individual was exposed. And what they did was they, they quarantined. And that, that young man was quarantined and then went in for a test. That's before the testing changed. And with that uh, test, by the time he came off, the doctor took a look, he no longer, uh, they didn't retest, they didn't have to. And he was okay, it's like the flu. After so long when you have it, at least the way they're looking at it right now, you're, you're not contagious anymore. And so that doesn't account, but that's something we can talk about. When did those early numbers occur to make you put us at a 10? If it was three weeks ago, they might not be part of our nine. Those are all ours, but the exact protocol for this has not been given up. Other questions, comments? Would you go to the next slide, please? Oh, I'm sorry, I didn't say yes. I, I have a comment. You know, we talk about um, the possibility of an outbreak here. I, I've done a lot of um, research on an array of things, and, you know, a, a virus is, if you have a strong, healthy immune system and you take care of yourself, you know, it's like the cold, you know, and, and like we talked with the testing, there's so many, I know two different incidences, someone died in a motorcycle accident and was written COVID-19. There's so much that's not right, um, that doesn't make sense. And another thing is, um, I don't know if any of you heard of 5G. And it's not 5G, your cell phone 5G, it's 5G, the information, you know, the, the highway of information. And, and I can't help but when I look here and see the tower and wondering what the plan is for that tower. Because when I know there's 4G next to it, but when this tower rolls out, and maybe you put more on there, we've got the 5G, the large round panels on there, that will cause the same effects as COVID-19. You will get heart palpitations when you're with, you know, around in two months. It's radiation coming off of there that is unsafe for all of us. And I don't know how to answer you other than we will follow what we're given uh, through the state. Next slide, please. I'm sorry, I missed your hand. Thanks for spotting. 
So the first line of, of defense, I'll go back to what's going on in your home, how well you follow the protocols and everything, um, how are things going, what, what's everybody in your home used to, what are you doing? You have a lot of the control on that. And for example, I used this the other day, and if we talk to uh, any of our staff members, uh, our nurses, they'll tell you that we have kids that get on the bus and, and the kid will tell us, yeah, mom, mom gave me some Tylenol this morning so I can come to school. And then we have them here, we have to send them home. home. We are responsible. We have to take care of them. Uh, we have to take care of our kids and, and be responsible parents, be a responsible community. Second line of defense, We'll be screening students as they come in and when they uh, walk, as they walk in the door. So that's the second line. If they come down with symptoms during the day, we'll refer them to the nurse's station uh, to be reevaluated. Sometimes, as the nurse would tell you, or the principals would tell you, some, some of these kids just get so wound up with stuff, they need to lay down for a little while and later on they'll be well. But they know their business and they'll take care of it. Yes, no. Um, how comprehensive is that screening going to be? Is that going to be screening as they come in the door? And also, the person doing the screening is going to be trained? Uh, yes, but the training is minimum. Uh, part of the coming in uh, is their temperature will be taken by not touching. That has to go into the computer for the tracking so we know uh, where it is. That's very, very uh, important. There will be some other things, you know, they might be a question or two, and that's something that I said, we need to find how to talk to a kindergartner. We already know how to talk to the young adult. So there will be different questions for that. Um, I wish, because one of the symptoms, you, would you go to the next slide? I think that one was symptoms. If you notice down there, one of the symptoms is loss of taste or smell. Um, I think that one comes before the beans. And the temperature is 100.4. Uh, that's that's when it becomes a suspect. Uh, every one we know runs different temperatures, and they can vary quite a bit before they come down. But you look at these, and these will be things that we'll also be asked or look for, especially uh, if they seem to, to have some symptoms. They'll be screened by a nurse because they are the experts in this area. Just because they have diarrhea, does that mean? No. Um, I feel I have a feeling we're going to have more running noses than we've ever had. Being these kids have been apart for six months. Yeah. You know. So. Yeah. I mean. Yeah, it's uh, it's strange times. Nothing is normal. Anymore. Any other questions? Yes. How do you how are you going to screen if buses are coming in? Are you staggering buses? We'll get to that. Promise we will get that. Okay. You? Alex. Yes, yep. Ellie. Um, so the screening um, again is that a mandate or is that a recommendation? From what we're screen? given is many, many recommendations. That is one of the recommendations that we have. Strongly recommended it. they are screened. Um, Every day who's screening. Yep. And you'll see how that that comes in. Uh, that's to protect everybody else. We need to. At least at this point. Any others? Yes. It's just interesting because so much of what's on there, everything on there, is everyone's experience in their life many times when the flu season comes around. So. Absolutely. Should they be in school when they have the flu? Yeah, they're just out a day or two, but to have a mandated, uh, yeah, when you're feeling sick, stay home for a day or two. But to go as far as we are with masks and distancing and things like that. It's the it's the flu. It's a common virus. I'm sorry. How is the screening going to work? How do you line up? Is it looking I'll go through that when we get to busing. That'll that'll be a huge part of this. Ellie. And, and parent drop off. Yes, Ellie. So along with that screening. Um, like she had mentioned, so okay, so say Jesse has the kids lined up as the school nurse, and you've got a kid with a body ache. 
I mean, are you gonna send them home every time? That's where our nurses will take a look. They'll check them out. They might ask them to rest for a little while, recheck with them. You know, I'm not a professional in that field by any means. But as a district, I mean, okay, so, okay, so say, you know, say the school nurse does come up with, you know, maybe this is someone, I mean, then as a district, do we recommend them going to get tested? Do we recommend them um, quarantining? I mean, I have nurses now that I've been working with, and after this has been going on long enough, I mean, the one came into contact with somebody with COVID and went to his employee health and said, come to work. I mean, I guess what I'm confused and frustrated with is just what we have to do and what, I mean, by law, what we have to do and what as a district we need to do. I guess I totally agree. It's a virus that's never, ever, ever going to go away. So we start this year with school and they have to take temperatures on every child. I mean, are we gonna do this for forever or, I mean, when, I don't know. That's, I guess, like I said, that's my frustration. How long do we know this is gonna happen? I don't have that crystal ball, I don't know. And, and that's why we have to wait to get even more direction. So when we're getting direction, who is the direction? Department of Education, Department of Health. It will be from the Department of Health through the CDC. So the CDC comes down to the Minnesota Department of Health and then it, it moves out from there. We follow the sky now. No? Would it be possible to break out um, just so everyone knows what is required and what is recommended? That, that is. That is on some of those different things, and this is what they told us. We are not expected to do everything that is recommended. We're expected to do the things that we can do that are recommended. That, and, and some are stronger recommendations than others. And again, this is a wrong threat. This is the first draft thing of this, and that's why we want to be done. But is there anything that's like you flat out have to do X. You yes. Flat out have to do Y. Yep. yep. Absolutely. You can do Z, maybe or maybe not. Is um, there any way to give me a list of things? Yeah, it's that, that, that is on the prep page. And, and we can post that or, or you can go to you can go to uh, I believe was that part of the it might have been in mandate twenty eighty two. Is that that thing? Yeah, okay. I can look it up, yeah. but I think a lot of people um, get confused about what's required and what's mandatory and what's recommended. And uh, how far down the recommended path do we, or can we go or should we go or do we want to? Go? We had, yes. And for example, we had a discussion on that yesterday as a cabinet. And one thing read one way, but then you have to find another thing that says, no, this is what you're supposed to do here. So sometimes even the wording on that uh, is not fully clear. And that's why you end up sitting in so many meetings with so many, you know, there are meetings with the uh, Department of Ed, meetings with the health, meeting with the superintendents, taking it back, asking questions. It's, I, I can't, uh, I think Sherry, I know you're walking out, but were you the one that looked at some of this? And, and when you start to look, there's a reference to go to another place. I'm sorry, go ahead and walk out. I just, Sherry and I were sharing this before, and then you can click on this site, and there's there 10 more things to look at. Russ is nodding his head, he's been studying it too. There is there. Yeah. Yeah. Well, the thing I want to say about that is, I think MD and the Minnesota Department of Health and CDC have to be more in tune with one another because we're getting recommendations from MDH. Recommendations that we're not necessarily getting from MDE or in the CDC recommending this. So there's just the amount of information that's flowing on recommendation and mandates is it's staggering. It's truly staggering. I agree with Noel. When is it too much or when is it enough? I mean, there's just the amount of the amount of paperwork and the paper presented is, is 
determines that this is an MDH, this is a Department of Health recommendation. Is this recommended by MDH via MDH? It's been safer. So I have a question now since you're here, you got the floor. Uh, is this another one of those things where they put us in school board or jail, or is this going to be tied to our fundings? Um, funding, this is not going to be tied to funding. What's going to be tied to funding, obviously, is where our economic place is in the state right now. Right now, economically, the state has, lack of better words, I don't want to say squander, I don't even know better words. Had they have utilized more than what we got in surplus, and we are now in the deficit. So that's what that's what's impacting our funding. I don't think the decision we make is going to put us in any type of you know whatever the school board decides isn't going to put us in a predicament. Yeah, I, I, I just want everybody to realize too that the decisions that that we make, with the benefit of hindsight, will be wrong. This, this whole COVID thing is just no matter what you choose, there's a, it's a wrong answer. So what we have to do is come up with, as a community for the right answers. Go ahead, Noel. Uh, I think what we ought to, uh, you know, when you have all these recommendations flying around, keep in mind that I'd like to have a third grader that can read at a third grade level at the end of this year. And, uh, whatever, you know, we're talking about spending a lot of time so far doing all this distance masking and musical chairs and stuff. But at the end of the year, I'd really like to have a third grader that can read third grade level. And history, math, and on and on. I don't want us to lose sight of why we're here, why this building is here. <coughs> All right, John. Go ahead. Yeah, I think you know all, all I can say. Oh, is, I'm sorry. Maybe. I just just one comment for the school board is just to keep in mind that as as a taxpayer and also as a as a parent of children who's only the school here, regardless, I don't want a ton of money to lose the kids that walk out the door either if their parents don't want them to be school because they don't want to stay. So there's that happy medium of having to do enough but not too much. And I don't I don't know where that line is. I guess that's job trying to figure out what's recommended yeah. versus what's required. What I got from that was John Lennon. The other thing, the other thing that I wanted to say too, I think um, somewhat we, we talked about taking temperatures too. I'm just not totally convinced that that's going to, that just, just be aware that's not going to solve our problem either. So a kid could come in with under that and still have COVID or over and not have so. I, again, like everybody else here, I don't think I know the answer. I, I don't know what the science you got any is. in the house yet? Yeah. Jesse, Jesse definitely got a question. If comes in and it's 10 degrees outside, and you shoot him in the head with your little thermometer thing, and he's really 104 in his core temperature, what are you going to be reading? Oh, yeah, 
happens on a daily basis for developers or entrepreneurs that come in and talk about this. They have their whole year. They come in, they take the bus, they get in, and they're running 99 feet. 99.9% of that time is they're bus sick, they're going to pull down, and they need to they rest for a bit and then go on the way. So it is a reevaluation of what happens right then and there. It's the coming in the door and evaluating right there, there's a lot of things that we have to think about on that. There's a book of all of these, they're trying to stand behind them. They see that you removed, they have to figure all that. And then that happens, you know, everyone talks. The lady got removed, she must be going home, she must have to be So you'd have Kenny COVID then. Correct. So there's a lot of things that have to be done with that. Um, but definitely, I don't know what that will look like with rechecking. Now, when you're looking at a tenth of a degree as your dividing line, and, it, and it's cold outside? Yeah, we'll have to be very careful with what that will look like. But one of the first signs that my understanding is, and I think it came on trying to remember, is John Hopkins was the loss of taste and smell. That was one of the early signs, and I'm hoping that might be another way to just check. We can be a little so we gotta get a bag of those multiple yeah, flavor sure, jelly yeah. beans. <laughs> but, but right now, you know, all we can do is what we we're working with. And again, I'll emphasize: this is a draft, and that's something we can talk about. Next slide, please. And then, as I already said, they'll reevaluate. Go ahead. Um, now we get to the busing that the parents pick up and drop off and everything. Um, one of the things that uh, we have to do, here you go, um, is to not put everybody in the same door at the same time. How can we keep them separated? The more we can separate our students so they don't mix and match, uh, the better. We said that a few weeks ago or uh, yeah, when was the last quarter week meeting a week ago? I said that if, if we could keep them separated, that's the best. And so working with transportation and the things, the guidelines and the mandates they have to follow. Um, this is an example at elementary school that uh, is worked out right now. Is they would uh, the bus, the door nine, is fifth grade. Why would we drop there? And that's the, the east north door closest to the Catholic Church there. That's because in that hallway is where the fifth graders are. And so if the bus would stop there, and we're in a nice U, it stop at door eight if there are any fourth graders on, stop at door seven, three for third graders, then we go to uh, second graders in door one because the classrooms are right there. And then uh, door uh, 13, broken glass, so we have to get new members on there. That's the one on the uh, west south corner. And those would be the different doors. We're, uh, we're supposed to separate on entry, um, not have everyone, like I said, deliver. And that's one of the things separate. So, one of the things we talked about is having the buses go, and I put this in the briefing I sent out last night to parents uh, start to deliver at both schools at 8 to 8.20, and then cars come in. We're working on a few different things uh, to maybe help those that uh, come early. One of the things, go ahead and flip it, please. So I put that in there. Uh, secondary times uh, will be the same, and pickup times will be determined. Yeah, we're still trying to work with that and get some of the quirks out on that. Again, the idea is not to have people all uh, together getting off the bus. Right now, buses park there. They, uh, all of them get out at the same time and mix it in and out and everything else. Question? Yes? There are some students who come to the high school or when they come on a pre today and then come from up here or the north, that's still going to happen? Um, right now we haven't discussed that. That's kind of a, a minor point. Um, it will take a look at that. 
one of the problems is, is what we have to do with the buses. And as you know, uh, right now in uh, in-person learning, the buses are uh, do not have to be socially distant. That's why one of the things they say is, if you're on a bus, you need to wear a mask. Because uh, you cut that down. Any other questions? Yes, Randy. So, I kind of beat up on this one last year, but we can't have those buses sitting out the elementary full for five or 10 minutes. Well, I'm well aware of that. And with, you may have multiple fallen parents driving their kids, they might be showing up 15 or 20 minutes earlier than schedule. So the buses can't sit in full. They got to get them off of the buses. I, I totally agree with you. That's why we, we set up and hopefully parents, you know, help us out here because the sooner we can have free flow around, the faster parents can come in and, and take their place. And uh, there's a plan right now to pick up and drop off. I agree with you, especially in this situation. It, it's recommended that when buses pick up, uh, all the windows when they're traveling, all the windows are open when they get there. That'll work. A little harder for them to walk, right? That'll work. Yeah, I don't think they'll be doing that in 20 below. But that's about as close as you, you get packed in a bus. Yeah. Oh, yes, that's something that's given. You know, family member, no, <laughs> take it back. That would be in the hybrid. It only households. I use the word households in this Spanish class. So households would be there. Um, However, the LSD should load uh, back to front. And obviously, I don't know if the back of the can I do that, especially with multiple stops. So that, that would be the answer. That's, that's one of those things. Maybe. Or I, I work in a school forever, so for kiddos that get dropped out of school, there's a ton of them. Are you, are you telling parents that if they, we want them to drop out, but if they can't, if they have to drop out before 820, they have to ride a bus? Or how is that working? We're working on that. As you know, we have a map uh, program uh, in Telvis hit last year. I think that's on the next slide. I could be wrong. But even for high school kids, because are the doors going to be open before 820 for kids to come in for sales? The one, that, one thing they won't be able to do is congregate one place. That's the problem. That's what they're saying. Let's not do that. Um, and we're talking about other things with that. Yeah, um, kind of what Amy said. I mean, as far as like on paper, this looks great, but if a parent starts work at eight o'clock, I mean, this is just so unrealistic in the real, in the everyday life of every parent. I just don't know how we're going to implement it or who's going to be walking around school breaking kids that are congregating up. They haven't seen each other in six months. They're going to want to talk to each other. I mean, <laughs> I, don't I, know. I don't know what to tell you. I mean, what we're trying to do is follow what's, what we've been given. Right, and I understand and, and that. That's all we're doing. And that's one of the smaller details that we're looking at. What do we do with, with parents that have to drop off early? You know, that's something that, that the different groups are working with, you know, saying, what can we do? Who can be there early? That's, that's why we meet with the parents. That's why we meet with our teachers. Staff. And on the lines of what Noel said, I mean, I want to be sure once this stuff is implemented or when we do find out, you know, what our mandates by law are, what we can do different. I mean, we can't concentrate their, the whole day and year on COVID. I mean, we got to be sure these kids are here learning. I mean, and I guess I'll talk to that person at the M MPE when I can, but you know, as a board making these decisions, I mean, okay, great. We made it through the year with no COVID cases, but no one learned anything. <laughs> you know, I mean, where's that balance? And I think we just, as a community, I mean, I would assume everyone's on the same page. You send your kids to school to learn. And from what I understood is if you didn't want to send your kids, there is that going to be that option of distance learning all together, correct? Correct. But that has to look different also. Sucks. So just real quick, Don. So we, we do move, 
we are able to go back fully. The buses, we don't have to do the, you know, the distance. You, you can, everybody can go, you know, you can hypothetically do the same bus for all the kids are just required to wear masks on the bus. Is that correct? Yes. Or they still want to be distant? Yeah, on the right or wrong? No, not, not when we're in person learning. In person. Okay, in person, but again, you, you, you'll feel up from back forward. Sure. Uh, they might even be assigned seats. Sure. Okay. So hypothetically, if we started today, routes would run, we would have to really modify bus routes. Knock on wood, right? Yeah. Okay. Okay. And, and then the good yeah. routes? Yes, I saw that. Yeah. Well, I just wanted to piggyback on the Amy and Kelly. Um, my dog has transportation survey. I was like, yeah, I totally know how to bring my kids to school. And then I saw this kind of stuff on my, but I have to work at 7 30, so they get dropped off at 7 25. So that's. Yep, I understand that. I have a question about that. See, you drop them off at the 725. Can't they just go in their classroom and sit there until? Oh, I don't do that. Just knowing that they can get in, right. they'll be together. Is there a each other. There, are, there are some times, and that's finding people that can be there. And that, that's the biggest problem. Let's explain the way it is now. Drop off now at the 8 o'clock. So they can get up there. But if parents want to come early, they can go to the bathroom and grab the paper. And if we get a lot more volume, money to drop it off early, we don't have the employees because the teachers aren't on duty until 8 o'clock. So there aren't teachers there to supervise to get ready for that. But the drop off time right now is 8 o'clock. People are pretty good, they are good with that. And if they come a little early, we have to the cafeteria. If they come before quarter to 8, do we, do we like run a calisthenics program in the gym or something? I mean, we do things in the gym, but typically there's only 10, 20 kids. So My guess is if, if you, you got people dropped off, dropping off, 50 to 70, that's the only And that, the reason for that abrupt increase in the drop off here is because we don't want them on the bus. Could be. Don, do you have something on on whether we can pay for that or not? <laughs> I was waiting for it. You killed me! You killed me! so ready for it, guys! We are, we did put that on the parents to drop off, but my dog has been in the back wall with everybody in this whole separate situation, but we are desperately, we don't have enough bus drivers to do all the back wall. That is another added. Bad situation we have. We're not just bus drivers, we don't have anybody to get the boat. So that is another impact on this district. We have all of this money we are putting in all this money. You know, with parents dropping off, that would alleviate some of that problem potentially. It's a statewide problem and it has nothing to do with pay. It has everything to do with the kind of protocol it takes to be a bus driver. Very good, sure. Again, I would say, you know, one reason we bring this is to hear the feedback. So then we have some more that we can talk about. That's why it's so important. It, and so try to communicate more and more uh, and collect the information. Good I, would just, all of them. I would just think if we ask parents to drop off to try to alleviate some of the problems, we have to do something on our end to mm -hmm. help them out. I totally agree with it. You know, because we're only talking about the morning. What about the parent that's not there in the morning for the kid, but can't be there until 3.30 to pick them up at night? I mean, so you, you have both sides of the day, so, you know. Understood. Could you go to the next slide, please? This is where I was saying earlier, right now we're trying to find staff members to do the math. Um, Bill's working with that. I know uh, I asked. Hill, or uh, did I get that right? I asked the parents rather uh, to look in and see what ones we have. And this might be again where we ask the parents if there's some parents that would like to do this in the morning just to help receive kids and help us out that way. I can't talk about pay. 
you say that you don't want to talk about schedule. Um, and if, if I get back into this a little bit more, because in days, the, the interpretation of days in days is that we directly have to make contact with that student. It sets up other problems that we have as well. In, in that with uh, distance learning, what do we do if they have, let's say, a metal shop or a welder? How, how do they, they do that? How do they learn that? Um, that's one of many. Number two, how does a teacher prepare for the day? How does the teacher teach during the day, do what they need to do with the class they have, and then take even more time with the distance learning? So part of that is actively engaging, trying to bring them in at certain times. What I know of this, um, and I learned this real fast from uh, David again, is that even with a hot spot, if we say, okay, we're going to just stream you all day, uh, you know, into the classroom. And David told me, what if we did that, what, five, six days with the program that we have, and then we have to pay more, even when they say it's unlimited, it ain't. Anyone experience that? Now, I, I know I had parents talk to me about that. They, they tried to do as much as they could with that, and they just couldn't do that. So that becomes very important for us. So being tactful when we allow them to stream in is one thing. Okay, and then I, to me, all in or all out, I'm not sure. That's a good question. I think that's something to look at. How could, what would that look like? But also my concern is how, how does a teacher do that? You know, I mean, some people think all they do is stand in front of the class all day. The number one thing that we're told they need to do, the number one thing that came out from parents is the relationship, the social and mental health of our students. And as we know uh, from uh, Maslow, that's the number one need. It, kids don't learn if they're worried about their life. To learn about how to protect themselves far before they do anything else. And uh, we want to get them where they feel comfortable and safe. And so that will be very important. Number two, when we first start, uh, the number two thing is to make sure our students and our parents understand how this works. So we need to teach them that, not just the lessons, because they're not going to be able to get math if they can't do that. So I, I hope you have an understanding of the board and parents how big this is. Go ahead to the next slide, please, unless there are more input or questions. So to ensure we meet the needs of the distance learner, we need to change. And I've kind of talked about that. We need to be able to have the time for contact and have personal time with those students. And if they can come to school, that would be even more important. Next one. So this is, and I, I said we'll get to that other part for you um, when we talk about schedules. But this is what, uh, to, to limit how much moving around that we're doing during the day, the ideal, the ideal uh, uh, class would be a one period day and you're in that same class until you finish it, but that's a practice. That was one of the problems with the full block. It is that you could literally take math, your freshman year, finish it in your first block, and not take it until the end of your sophomore. Um, for an example, that's how drastic it could be. So, what uh, reading, doing a lot of study, this is what the goal, and he worked with teachers with coming up with this kind of modified uh, seven period day. We still have a seven period day. And so, what's part of that? On odd days, use the odd number. But you need to understand that uh, fifth period is actually uh, what we call royal hour. And that's where they would work with the uh, teachers in a room uh, that they're in. And they would help them with various assignments, help them learn if they need. They could uh, bring people in to work with them, all sorts of possibilities for that, and make those con contacts. And also to check for their social well-being as well. Um, I know they've used it. I uh, to see if we have any secondary uh, teachers. I'm not seeing any here right now, but that would be part of it. Um, some of our larger classes would meet in the Lions Den to help us, the Media Center, the North Gym, 
Catholic Church. So those are some of the plans there. Um, on the even days, which they're calling B, is two, four, six, eight. And that's where the, the seven periods, we have seven periods, but one period is making it eight. So those are even days, and you'll see how that plays out later. Questions? Next one, please. Yes, Russ. So this, this schedule that you have, the seven period date, this is for when we're in the building, right? Or is this the hybrid? This is only hybrid if we go hybrid. Well, here's one of the things that I like so much is we want to, once we get started with this, the more we can keep things the same, the better. And this allows us to transition to exactly what you're talking about the same way. So what you're saying is school is going to look like this, even if you say you want school to be open, and everybody come to school, you open, open for school, it's going to still look like this. Yeah, it, it, yeah, this is the idea here. And not only that, if you think about labs of any type, um, they're longer. That's a lot better uh, than trying to do, for example, like I taught AP Biology, minimum length on a, a lab for that is 72 minutes. You can pull the shortest one off in 72 minutes, the rest of it took a little longer. Well, this would automatically allow those kind of labs to run. Ellie? So would this modify um, seven day period and the hybrid, you know, are kind of on the same page. What is the benefit of that? Again, if there's less movement during the day, with them, they're getting all their classes, they're continuous throughout the, the whole semester into the next semester. Uh, versus, I know one school, St. John's, is doing a one period day. So, for example, they'll take math, they'll spend every day so they stay in their their uh, complete group, their cohort, or, or uh, I forget what we use for that term all of a sudden. Uh, you call me on it. A pod, there we go. Pod. Yeah, a pod. Sorry, we, we start talking dead speed. That, that kills us. So, yes, that, 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 the benefit is less movement, plus, it allows us to get our lunches done better and be able to bring the secondary down into our, our and use both cafeterias plus the gym. Just checking if Dawn is more on that end. Any other questions on that? Yes, it's it's basically double of what it is now. So are teachers prepared to teach for 90 minutes or just work with skills for 90 minutes? Is that the period of the course I, I totally agree with you uh, on that. It absolutely is. And, and again, it's a matter of uh, many of our teachers do this already, uh, that they're, they're diverse, they're moving, they're working together, they're moving on, they're checking, moving on. Um, some are still traditional, and it's sit and get. You can't sit and get that long. That's terrible. We know that because you're already in it. Um, I, I was a principal at a school with a four period of day. And, and, uh, but this is different. This is, yeah, one day you have this, the next day you have this. Then the next time you're back here, the next time you're back here. But that's not there's a method, but in COVID, our kids aren't going to be able to Take a break mid, mid 90 day period and go all the way and stretch their legs and things like that. So um, one, one of the things that we've talked about is when you can take your class outside for a break. Matter of fact, that's one of the advocacies they're saying is let's take your classes outside to teach when you can. A little hard in Minnesota. Uh, long about February, January, obviously, but let them talk, let them communicate, let them walk around and give them that socialization, which I think is so very important for all our kids. Um, a little more limited at the elementary, um, and I don't know what to do, but to me, that's, that's where we give ideas to people and they, and they work with it and see it. That's why it's important to get ideas from people. Yes. Well, what they say, uh, I'm glad you asked a great question. 
And the question was, uh, they're not uh, told they have to social distance, right? They, so they're not social distancing. We are told that we're supposed to do the best we can with social distance, but we recognize you can't do that and have everybody in the school unless your school's empty and you got a lot of uh, money to hire a lot more people. So, so they said, let's be practical. And theoretically, if you got a mask on, that's better. But they're saying, even when you're working in groups, 15 minutes, try 15 minutes in a part of the group. If you dare, even try to be spread out. Um, one of uh, Phil's teachers uh, went in and said, How can I set up my room social distancing? And basically cleared out everything. And they got uh, 15 kids or 15 desks in there at the six foot required. Trouble is, the front row was like this to the wall. So it's impractical. So, how do you do that? So, now in that situation, in person, you're back at home. Uh, in the high school, it varies on the size of the class. Not all classes are the same size. And not all classrooms are the same size. We have larger classrooms that can accommodate a uh, fire, fire marshal. We have some rooms that can probably accommodate over 50 people easily. So that's not bad. And the social distance is almost done automatically. Okay. We have other rooms where it's more difficult, but that's where it's said, let's be smart. Let's use the larger rooms for multiple classes. Let's use these other spaces we have for larger classes. We're, we're practicing the best we can. Okay, you want to go to the next one, please? So the elementary schedule uh, will be in their, in their classroom. They'll stay in the same room as pop. That's ideal. And they'll bring in the interventions. They'll bring in the interventions. So, for example, correct me if I'm wrong, so, for example, then the Spanish teacher will come in and say, this, that's a good way to do it. You the Spanish teacher come to one room, do their thing there, and then they'll go to the next room and do it there. And that's how they're going to take it. The same as I the same as you. That, that's how that plan is. Uh, meals, eating in the rooms and cafeteria, depending where you are. Uh, in the building, but those are details we have to work out because we have to also follow the guidelines that were given uh, with uh, John's uh, uh, presenting. Yes. So, question about moving the teacher to the classroom, right? And I don't know that we have any other options, but the one thing I worry about what if that teacher then gets COVID? So now the, that Spanish teacher has just infected the entire elementary or whoever has Spanish. I mean, Maybe that's a risk we have to take, but I, I mean, I don't have an answer for you. I'm just saying what if, because right, I mean, I think we kind of, we know a spot where that sort of did happen, right? And, 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 so I, I don't know. Yeah, um, however, number one, this is what teachers have been told or, or should do. I'm not sure that this has got all the way through. Um, I think I shared it with the DLT, didn't I? Shields teach. Shields on when you're mm -hmm. okay. When I'm going to come up close, I put on the mask and work with it. And that, that's the protection we get. It's better than that than, than mixing all our kids together. That's one of my concerns in the second year. But okay. How do you do it in the second year? Uh, yes, a question. Oh, I'm sorry. Yes. No, I think there are plans that, that Phil has to get them out, just like every place else. They can get them out. Yeah. 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 Well, yeah. Yeah. Go ahead, Phil. Yeah. So, as far as Reed says, the fact that the teachers are bringing it off. They'll see how it is. They might mix when they're they might mix when they're in recess a little, when they're outside, and see that's a bad 
better situation. But the mix with the kids in the classes, that will be their main ability to start. And it's great feedback. So that can be something we talk about. Do you have a question? I think there was somebody over here first. I was just going to ask about the teacher that some of the kids are going to be in and out of the class. Yeah, it's supposed to. That is one of the things they're supposed so to do. So, like, you're coming in, you know, the family teacher coming in, the teacher and the kids come back, and the teacher doesn't want to be in the class, so they can take care of all the children. Correct. So, I, I don't think that's a horrible idea. Sherry? I turned it over to Phil a little bit on that, but yeah, right now you want to run it as much safe as you can. So, uh, I mean, if I didn't have to break my man, I would have to be here. And that's part of the right recommendation. Um, we have to check with our numbers on that yet. And that's still Normally we run a night of registration night just because of the regulation this year. It's really well, you know, a monthly rent is all we do. So good question. Uh, Jesse asked something. I was just gonna add on um Ansel earlier your question as far as the kids. I think now That's a good point. I, I guess I did not know that. I think I had read that. And, and like you said, it probably will change again, but it's what we have to work with today. So that when I said we're going to make mistakes, we're going to make mistakes, but we, we have to work with the data we have today. So, Ellie? And I think the other two, um, the thing too that we got to look at is with the masks. I understand that that's supposed to be the protection. Um, but I don't care what age a kid is, an adult. When I walk through a store and everyone has masks on, they touch them, put it up, touch them. You know, it's constant. And I think, I think as a society, it excuses us from just plainly washing our hands. I have a mask on and gloves, so I don't need to do that. I've seen it a million times, places I've gone. So I think we need to take that into consideration too. When you've got K through five for sure, and masks are going to be up and down and off and on the desk and wherever. So I don't think that clearly takes them away from exposure either. And even with my boys, I mean, uh, I know exactly what's going to happen. You know, I mean, just all things. We, I think, like Teresa said, the realistic part of it is what we need to look at for our district. And, and I think Randy has said that this is where we start, it's a starting point. And where do we go? What do we find out we can do as we go along? And she said, hey, it's good for them. Well, when they're outside, there's more leeway. When they're in large areas, there's more leeway. When they're exercising, there's more leeway. Come up here and watch uh, the boys uh, basketball in the morning, or the weight room, or uh, watch the uh, uh, Girls basketball working out, they don't have the masks on. It, it's as much as we can do with what we have. That might be the best way to put it. You got Russ. One more question. So, the, I know one of the requirements that they want to talk about build routines of hygiene education practices. So, Correct. so some of that, what Ellie said, I'm assuming that I did I looked through real quick. There is going to be, maybe it isn't, but there's going to be regular hand washing, that type of thing, other ways. Yeah, and I'm assuming reason, we have to do it. And, and the reason I wanted to come over here and, and just put on the mask. If you've ever been in this building, at any of our preschool and kindergarten that are working, not quite in her house because she's one of them, it is unbelievable how they have trained their kids. Matter of fact, we had to make sure we came soaked 
when we first opened because the original soap, it had a fragrance in it. I don't know why you need a fragrance in school. It was caught in a rash. These kids wash their hands regularly. Every single room is going to have hand sanitizers in it for you. Uh, right now, we're waiting for five. We have the, the dispensers to wait for. But that's another whole bit, and a lot of that is pretty cut and dry. Uh, it's a command. You got to do this. You got to do this. You got to do this. Um, I saw another game someplace. And maybe you know that from your building. Um, All right. Okay, next one. So now I wanted to get back to the beer student learning and how a beer question. And this is the one that I, I know the feedback that we're going to get. But realistically, what, what do we do for these students that are distance learning? And the number one thing we can do is bring them in. But how do we bring them in? They don't want to be in our schools on days that everybody's here. So one way we can bring it in and help our teachers out to make those connections, because otherwise I don't know when we make those connections. You know, they can only, they're limited so much with their day and with the requirements that we can do one day where the school, everybody is home. So everybody's on a distance learning plan. But that is a day that we bring in distance learners if they want to come in. We make sure we make those contacts with those kids. We take students that need that personal touch on a daily basis are still here. And we take those kids and have interventions that are here. And it'd be a time to have where everyone can work together. It's not like people are going home here other than one day a week. This is where I need the most feedback. Um, so in other words, let's just pick uh, Wednesday. So we go A, B in the high school, and, and on uh, Wednesday in the elementary in the high school, that is one day everybody is distance learning. And then, then we come back with everything else going there. And that would help our people uh, to reach out to the distance learning, because that, you have no idea uh, how much that's emphasized. The section button. I don't know if you've seen that in your exploration or not. Feedback, please. I I don't believe so. Uh, I you know it, if if we did that would be a, a, a fix right there and then. We won't really know until we know. That might sound crazy. And if that's the case, yeah. It's a wonderful idea. Wonderful idea. It, it is, but I will give you this exception. So you can't enforce it. Okay, so so that's exactly what we want. We put out the survey initially to get a feel to start working with stuff. So we have an idea of roughly it was under, but not much under 20%. Will that be real? Will it not? Will other people decide? I think it depends where things are headed at the time. More people as we get started might say, you know what? I think we're okay to come, come back to school. We can't say, no, you can't come into school anymore. All we can do is get that piece of information as best we can. And if you, if you notice, I put in this is not uh, automatic, you know. That, okay, we know that you can change your mind. Yes, this is, uh, absolutely, that is one of the plans to do, is to slide out with each one of our parents. If that's the case, yes, we can do that. We also know that we might be able to, but maybe not in all circumstances, uh, some of our staff might not be able to be in the class. And, and uh, that would be a place where they would make the connection. At the lower levels, that would work better than at the higher levels where they're more diverse um, and segregated as to what they can teach. We may not be able to take AP chemistry or distance learning if we're open to school. Mm -hmm. I mean, just let's just 
system so that it may be something that we can't be everything to everybody. I, I understand, but that, that's one of the, that's why copy leads to uh, parts of these, as I said. We need to set aside that time. So I wanted to throw that out. Where are you with this? I have some elementary people here. Uh, Susan? so pleased to see how concerned you are about your children as I want to. But as I said, I want to make sure those kids feel safe coming to school and they and you as parents know exactly where, what, and when things are going to happen, how it's going to happen, and what's going to happen. Now what's going to happen, as Randy has said, as a former teacher, this is a teaching challenge. You're, you're setting up curriculum, you're setting, you're setting up classrooms, not just today, but maybe for people over here, people over here, and maybe we need to go from place to place to place. And that's all different for our educators now. 
So when you can hire a teacher, would you please? Because you really, really need to depend on their talents and what they're going to come up with. Because they're very creative and they love their children. And they don't want your children to be sick. And they don't want them to be afraid. And the only way we can prevent that is as parents and educators and leaders in the community to sit down and say, okay, we're going to be changing this in school, honey. Maybe you're not going to get them tired. Don't worry about being tardy. That was my big thing. Now it's these bus business. How many of these kids are going to worry about getting tardy? They all, you know, there are all these things that are in place. They already have them there. It's necessary that we can have them again somewhere, but right now, we as people, as adults, have to make adjustments a lot of them. But just think of the adjustments that kids have to be as Matt said, we want to make sure they're getting the best education they can. And I, I'm just so proud of the parents to come and the, the, the educators, the nursing staff, to be part of that program. You have no idea how important it is in this in this country. Anybody else? Yes. Oh, with making our children wear a mask all day in school, what is that going to do to their health? Um, if, if you follow the CDC, if you follow the recommendations that come out of there, which recently came out uh, this past week, I believe it was, when uh, one of the assistant directors, and this is something they all agree on, um, they feel that if everybody wore, if everyone could wear a mask, that it would be the same as uh, staying in your home all the time. Um, other countries have gone through this. That's the only thing I can say. And that, that's, that's what the CDC is handing off to the MDH, which is handing off to the MDE. I, I personally have a really hard time taking recommendations from the CDC because of the huge conflict of interest. They own the, the companies that produce the vaccinations and, and uh, so the vaccinations, they own those companies. So their conflict of interest is very high. I've got hundreds of reports from studies that have been done what masks do, um, that masks are neither effective or safe. OSHA even said that you should not be wearing masks. A doctor is saying that uh, masks um, pose serious health risks to the healthy. Um, there, there's many, there's another danger to wearing these masks on a daily basis, especially if worn for several hours. When a person is infected with a respiratory virus, they will expel some of the virus in each breath. If they are wearing a mask, especially an N95 mask or other type of fitting mask, they will constantly rebreathe the virus, raising concentration of the virus in the lungs and the nasal passages. And I know a lot of this information is hard to get by because the censorship right now is so high also. But there isn't one in here that says a mask is safe and effective. They're all saying you should not be wearing them. They're unhealthy. They restrict the oxygen intake by up to 60%. That's hard on the mental learning abilities. It's hard on the social of our children, the, the psychological. There's so much data that tests have been done, research has been done, saying that this is unsafe to wear a mask all day. And, and all I can say is we have to follow what the state says. We can't go off on our own. But or we're looking we at the problems. health of our children. And when, that should come first. The health of our children should be by far the very number one priority for all of us. Mm -hmm. And I couldn't agree with you more, but what you would have to do is take that up with the Minnesota Department of Health. You'd have to take it up with the Minnesota Department of Education. You would have to take it up with, with the uh, governor. That's the route to take on this. I, all we can do is what we're supposed to do. And, and a governor cannot are out, make a law. He does not have that authority. He doesn't have that power. And we're giving him that power. Um, actually, the executive order is full. What it can't do is override existing policy. It's only good for one year that it, it has to be voted on whether or not to continue it. 
but it's got to be uh, uh, to both the House and the Senate against that. That's all I can tell you about. Right, but foremost of, of all of it, we need to really be concerned about the health of our children and well, how this is going to impact them on a full health basis. I, I couldn't agree more. Matter of fact, uh, if you talk to our staff, that was one of the first things I put, put out there was the safety of our students and staff. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah, um, kind of on um, to piggyback your comment, I think too, another thing we need to be aware of is when I have my children as babies, your doctor tells you to expose them to germs to build a healthy immune system. Um, I think we need to be aware of all the hand sanitizers, what we're spraying around the rooms. I mean, I've been open now at the salon for two months and the finish of my chair is eight knots from the chemical. You know, I mean, I totally, I cannot agree more that we need to take into consideration the health of these kids. So we have them wear a mask for three months or whatever, and you take that off, guess what's gonna happen? There's going to be kids that get sick. It's the nature of the beast of the virus. It just gets, I mean, it grows and grows and grows. It's never gonna go away. And if we continue to create an immune system that can't fight it, that's not gonna be good either. And then I do have one other question. So, and I don't know if John or Don or if anyone knows, when all the businesses were closed and everything was closed down in March, including the school, what deemed certain businesses as essential? Does anybody know that? I mean, no, I don't, but wholeheartedly, I am very, very disappointed that our governor of this state did not look at our education as essential. This is our future. I mean, yes, is there risks out there? I don't want to sound heartless, but people can die. I mean, I could die going home in a car accident. And I don't know if there is a way we can as a district deem our school as essential. I I don't think anyone really signed up for this. I mean, you've got tons of nurses out there dealing with it daily since it started. You've got gas station attendants, you, you've got Walmart workers. I didn't want to be closed for three months. I mean, at what point do you, yeah, deem the education of our children essential? Kathy? Um, I just want to say right now, I think we can't be. Um, yeah. There's a need for some opinions about everything. Yeah. You start going to social media and you drive yourself crazy. For every throw of one that we have to have their soul, we all have our own oh. personal opinion. I mean, even how you said so. And, that, and everything else has to be with yeah. COVID. So that's what I tried to explain before, and maybe I should go a little. All this COVID thing has managed to do in this country is divide. Um, if we open up the school with masks, there's going to be people upset because they have to wear masks. If we open it up without masks, there's going to be people upset because they don't have masks. If we open it up taking temperature, there's going to be people upset because we're taking temperature. If we don't, so what we have to do is find the things that the CDC is is still reasonable and do it because you know. I've seen the stories and I, I don't I don't want this thing either, but I'm not real scared of it either. So, but you know, it's not like I drive a hundred miles an hour down the highway hoping I don't crash. So, you know. So. Mark, did you have something? Well, I, I was just wondering, is our mask a choice or? Um, actually, there's a lot of uh, exceptions to wear a mask rule. Like if the child is physically having a problem with it or emotionally having a problem with it, uh, just those two alone pretty much covers every kid who doesn't want to wear the mask. And as a small child, if they're told they have to, they don't feel that they can be fed. Well, they don't need to be told they have to. They need to be told, we'd like you to wear this mask, but if you can't, it makes you difficult to breathe or if it's causing you to not be able to concentrate or 
whatever thing it is. And I agree with most people trying to get a mate that you like to meet and sit still for 10 minutes. Well, and it's not, it's going to be hard to stop it over the place. They haven't sat still for six months now either. For, mm -hmm. So you're going to have that. Yeah, so. and there's a lot of exceptions. I'm sitting here as an exception right now. I'm more than the distance from you, so I'm not there anymore. And it helps you hear me better. It's actually an exception for me to welcome the people out. Right. Go ahead. Um, I just had a question about going from being first to the high grade to the learning. I've been seeing a lot of other districts that are starting right at the high grade learning. I don't know that the answer that one. Um, yeah, that's sort of a planning for things to go bad. And uh, I'm kind of, this is just my opinion, that I'd like to plan for things to go well and then have a plan B to shift into when they start, when the numbers climb, if they do. But there's no guarantee that the numbers are going to climb. Some people are convinced they will climb with the winter and the more indoor stuff. And, uh, I, I think that's a reasonable assumption. I think we ought to start off. And the reason why I think that is if you can establish a relationship with that third grader and his parents for a couple of weeks before you shift into distance or hybrid learning, you know who you're dealing with. But if you start off, um, you know, with less than that, then you don't have that relationship and you don't have that initial introduction to that child and his parents. You know, as a, especially in elementary type kids, I think it's important to get that relationship initially and then you can deal with things as they happen. Yeah, that's what happened last spring. There was an abrupt stop. Two days later, start with a totally different system, and that was an abrupt change. But it wasn't a local decision either. No, but this, you know, if we start off with, we're going to start off with the social distancing, but we're going to have people here face to face and get some relationships going, and then if we have to shift off into more of a Secondary modifier right? will be less abrupt. And I think that's what the principal surprises set up is to be as close as they could to a hybrid without being in a hybrid. Um, and to go back to that, that big, you know, how, how do you even that out? How do you make those connections in a hybrid? Because um, I know, number one, I'll go back. It, there's a way, we're trying to figure it out. We're limited by room right now to store stuff uh, to uh, increase the space for uh, possibly having added classes. We're looking at renting, because we don't have space here, renting portable storage units. That could be a possibility for us to set up for it. Um, but 
unique. I had heard that before. And I think, yeah, that's one of the things that we have to explore and see where we're coming from. Burden on the parents, both at home and the work at the school, are, that, that burden is heavy. So, um, I, since we're here, I'm, I had two questions when we started. Who's going to decide what we're in, and when are they going to decide? Well, that, that again, uh, you should have gotten a note last night. Yeah, I didn't read it. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I read it. I read it. I read it. It sounded to me like the board of well is going to tell us whether or not we're open or not. Uh, no, that's that's not the note we're referring to. I'm trying to get a uh, group meeting uh, that, that have uh, parents on the school board be part of this also. Uh, they have different groups, but there are so many different groups we have, we've got to incorporate. But, but are they going to make a recommendation to the Board of Education or are they going to make the decision? They should be making the recommendation to the Board of Education that the Board of Education uh, needs to make the decision. That's how it's supposed to work. That's why you were elected. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I can't get that one wrong. <laughs> <laughs> well, no matter, you know this, in, in either of our jobs, whatever you do, you're wrong. With some people, no matter what, it doesn't matter. Anything else? One, one thing I wanted to say about talking about this distance learning uh, as part of that for the day, we only do that on uh, weeks that we have school for five days. Uh, could you go to the next slide, please? So elementary is doing a feasibility study. I've shared that with you already. That, that definitely we'd like a kindergarten. We can figure that out how to do that. Um, and we'd like K through three as possible. We could, I'd love to have K through five in this situation. Um, questions, comments? Next slide, please. So the second theory is hybrid. This is how the no, two days for the A, or pardon me, two days for the A, but half of the ones are, are in this high school, the other half are the middle school. And then they're flip flop. Okay? And how we would do that, we'll have to find out what people think on that. Whether we go just what you said, I've, I've heard them all because I sit in superintendent meetings for the whole lot. It is whether you go senior high two days, do a deep clean, middle school in two days, do a deep clean. That, that's something we, we have to talk about. Or you go uh, high school, middle school, deep clean, high school, middle school. We've got to figure that out and put it out. That's half the students, but we feel with the added space, it's far easier to make uh, adjustments in different rooms to get the social distance. Uh, Joel's done a lot of work on that, I know. When I see my principal up here with the uh, yards uh, uh, tape measure and with the wheel to measure all the stuff, just calculating the hallways and everything, and not only that, our building and maintenance has been doing a lot of work with it as well. Um, uh, as for the elementary, if we have to, then we would do a division. That, that, that's a problematic. It's teaching the same thing while you're trying to teach distance or there to the same teacher. And that's something uh, that's that's something they know what they're doing better than I do. So that's something to go and sit down and have that periods and try to work out some of that. Any other addition? I used your name only because you must know. Uh yeah, just kidding. Next <laughs> one, he didn't make a face at me. Yeah. So, so this is the last slide. I don't know.
know how many more of these we'll have. Um, hopefully, we'll see how well that the streaming goes. Uh, John, you're up with a swim and trip. Maybe it's really good. Yeah. That was in there too. webinars and meetings with USDA and, and the Department of NBD and so Department of Education regarding how we are going to provide these lunches for our kids in distance learning. Um, so the last, this will be short and sweet, if we go into in-person learning, we are obligated by USDA, mandated to serve hot lunches. Hot lunch is going to be looking a little different this year than um, previous years. We are, we can't do offer versus serve. So that, that means we will be, our food is part of the position of all our food. We are no longer have a salad bar. So it will be dished fresh vegetables and or uh, hot vegetables and dished fruit on um, all in single serving containers. Most of our food will be, all of our food will be in single serving containers or in foil for um, lack of a better word. So they're telling us in in person, we still obviously are obligated to provide a hot lunch. I mean, it's going to look a little different than the secondary element. We're going to have one choice in the sandwich that we can put in a bag, whether we're hybrid in person learning or distance learning. It's just easier because those people are likely are going to have to be eating in their rooms also. So we want to eliminate some mess. Um, so hybrid, we're still in the in-person, anybody can see in the dates they are in-person, we are obligated to offer hot lunch. With all these options, we are social distancing at lunch. So the schematics of how we're having lunch is going to look a little strange, um, but we will work that out. And if we go to distance, we are in grab and go like we were in March, April, and May. We have not gotten any direct notification from the Minnesota Department of Education if it's all students or if it's just our students that qualify for um, nutritional benefit. So we are waiting for some direction on that. Um, and the grab and go is a little bit different. We are not as today mandated to deliver. We probably will, but that depends on our driver's situation, but we will have to probably do three plates, which makes every meal um, flammable, so lots of questions. Hi, do it. Okay, so what's our contingency in case of our lunch staff yes. somebody tests positive? We are actually, oh. Yeah, that's right. No, that's it. We're actually, we do have enough food service staff hired if somebody contracts COVID, but we are actually, Coming up, we're probably having to hire additional staff or have subs. Um, and a licensed driver. Would... Right now, we have one, two, we have three licensed people that have their manager's license. So I'm hoping that not all three contract COVID at the same time. Yeah, we do have contingencies in place. There are some special allowances from the from USDA because of that with licensures and serve safe. We're still obligated to, to provide a reimbursable meal under the National Food Program. Any questions for the program? I do want, as long as everybody's here, I just want to reiterate that food program is going to look different this year because of all the mandates and the stipulations on uh, food versus they're not having a fresh food bar. Um, we have to come up with um, foods that are easy to transport because we're going to have disposable trays in the secondary and grab and go type containers in the elementary. So I just want to get the word out to parents and to the community that we will be offering hot meals. We'll be offering like, um, for example, chicken or mashed potatoes, those type of things in single serve, but it's, there are some things that we will not be serving. Secondary, they all lunches. They will go through a line. We have, we have to. We cannot transport. We don't have the portable equipment to transfer lunch, so it stays to temperature. That was one of the mandates that our food had to stay temp. 
which it always does anyway, but we don't have the equipment and Minnesota Department of Education and USDA said if you don't have the equipment, do not participate because it's very expensive. So all our lunches will be going through a line and then going to their designated pods for lunch. And that's in elementary and classrooms and secondary, there's many different pods that these classes are going to go to. with what we know today and I, I, I don't want to speak for anybody um, that's that's my intention is to try to open the school that's, I think that's what everybody wants is to open the school but we got to do it safely so um, I think the idea of polling the families of seeing by a certain date what and, and then we should have the responsibility as a board of coming out and saying what we're going to do on opening day Two or three days after that, if August 24th was floated out there, if they can, if they can tell us what they think they want to do by the 24th, we should be a couple days later. We should be able to have a plan out and have it out. So, um, yeah, I, I just want to tell everybody that came, thank you. That's that's why we put the call out for input is because we don't think of everything. Um, Thanks for David for putting up the microphones and being here and all the other staff and principals for all the extra time. Nobody really signed up for a, in our personal lives or in, or in this. So I, I, I guarantee you that I wouldn't have ran for school board if I knew this was a, this was a deal. So we're in it though, so you know, let's let's power through it. So go ahead, Noel. Yeah, I'd like to. Uh... Second that, I appreciate the input. Uh, some of the people have gotten up and left, but I don't know if that was any frustration or what. But we do hear what you guys say. And uh, we owe you uh, a definitive statement of what we're going to do on opening day of school. We owe you that to the parents and to the teachers and staff. Um, if, if we don't have a clear, concise plan for what we're going to do on opening day, prior to opening day, so everybody knows what to expect, and we fail. So let's just set a date. Uh, when can you guys get all of your surveys and all of your collaborations done and present us with a plan? Well, that, that's... I would think we should be able to put that out there the week before our, our staffs come back, although we'll be asking staffs to come back earlier to help us with it. For example, um, we have a problem when we ask, not everybody takes part in the survey. We have to kind of let those that aren't that they qualify. So that, that would be very important. And uh, I we'll see what kind of feedback we get with that. That's why I wanted to get this out. Okay. So 
So I'm saying the week before I have to look at the calendar. Well, let's see. take a look at the calendar and write down the day. Right. Yeah, so it's going to be a catch-22 where the school administration doesn't know what they're going to look like until they find out who all is coming. And the people want to know what it looks like before they decide who all is coming. So we got to get over that catch-22. Yeah. And we have to set a yes, date where, okay, if you didn't answer the survey by this date, you lost your chance. And yeah, but I don't know that no. we can do that. No, but legally, well, we can go out yeah. and set it. Yeah, yeah. 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 we can say it. Just you can't hold it. Yeah. You're welcome to come. Yeah. If not, then we'll just inform you. So we have to have a date where we say this is how it's going to work when we come back to school. Because yeah. if we don't, there's so many moving pieces in there. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
to make a decision as a board yep. that night how we're going to go and yep. Yep. So that that that's that's the information these people are waiting for. Yep. The twenty fifth will this board of education will make a decision when what we're going to do. I know it's putting it out there, but I think it's the most responsible thing to do is to wait for the most current, rather than to say something tonight or say something in a week and then backpedal it in three weeks later. I, That's what I don't want. Yeah, right. when, when does school start? School starts uh, the uh, 8th is the first day. Okay, so if we can get our uh, act together and have it ready, Put out and vote on on the 24th. And, and we ain't gonna have everything right, but we can have a big part of it two together. Two weeks to oh. get their stuff, you know, organized for the schedule. And, and a lot of the detail work, unless it's getting changed, a lot of that detail work is done. The key is we have to figure out what schedule we're gonna find, work out some of the information we got tonight for what do we do in here, for the chat, on, on if we have that one day or not. We have to have the input from the board uh, and, and from the board members on what are their well, thoughts on this. In, in actually, it. John, I think I think the biggest question that you didn't see coming at all was that some parents may elect to do a hybrid even if we're open full. Yes, uh, I never seen that coming. Well, so, and, and I and thank you a, for being creative. I mean, well, you, you know can't be the only person that's thinking it. You know, you're one out of fifteen. Who is going to press? So yeah, no, right here. Yes. Oh. If they're quarantined, yeah, yeah, yeah. may not have it, but if they're quarantined, yeah, cross. So, so John, you, the idea of your survey is is it going to ask the parents, okay, what do they if they have to choose today, what would you prefer, right? Would they, you know, in you know, in the building, the hybrid or distance? And if they choose distance, I guess the follow-up question would be, if we are in full. Or hybrid, would you still choose to just have your child do distance learning, right? So then we could gauge that. You know, is is there enough there that we need to do a, a staff member or things? I think that I, I didn't think about that either. That was another thing that somebody talked about. Like, ooh, that actually is a great idea. <laughs> yeah, it's a great question. It was a idea, idea, right? Yeah, it's just so that, I guess that's what I was thinking because that would help me because then if I can, because you know, I'll vote on there just like everybody else, but it. Says, you know, go full. I guess that's where you know I'm going to see what the majority does. Now, the worst would be if it's three way tie for me, right? And well, then the, there's got to be some understanding. Like, you can't have auto mechanics Absolutely. and, and right. distance learn that very easy, you know. And, and now you just commit part of the reason for that, that nature, you know, that we talked about. Yeah. And the problem is to get over how do we handle the people. That don't have childcare, although, uh, although if they're quarantined, they, they wouldn't necessarily be able to come in anyhow. So, well, you, you may have, have that day and nobody shows up, right? But you have, I, I don't know about that. Um, that should be a question for your yeah. survey is if, if you choose the distance learn, would you be willing for your child to come into school on that off day? Maybe they wouldn't be willing for the child to come in anyhow. <laughs> Maybe. I guess I'm wondering for I just, I, I, I just, that concerns me as a person who's in education. How can you offer all three as an option? To do two of them is a stretch, I feel like, at the same time. But if you're really offering distance learning and you're really offering in person, how do you also do a hybrid? I mean, this is going to cast me out of it. The families always can choose uh, distance learning. Yes. The school decides whether you're going to do hybrid or in person. It just doesn't feel like it's a choice of a family. It feels like it's it's the situation is dictated whether we move to that or not. It's either we're in person or we're distance yeah. learning. I, I guess I don't know, but that yeah. And all it's going to take is that number to go up above ten to ten thousand, and the decision is going to get made for us. And then, but then everybody moves to that, which is different than doing three different things. I mean, you can get really 
really cute to uh, accommodate everybody, but what's it really going to cost you as a district at the end? It, 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 if that wasn't good, that wasn't I don't know what it, that that wasn't what I was thinking, right? To say no, I mean the most popular one would that would be you know like you said we always have to offer distance learning and, and get that and to me it would be this the question between in person or hybrid, right? I mean which one of those two are you going to do? Yeah, because I think depending on how you put your survey out, it might be as a parent I might think oh I have an option which way I want to do it and then they're going to do all three so I just need to pick one. Yeah. That's an important that, point. Be careful. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Go oh, so ahead. Um, I have a, I don't know if you have to go to the winter period, but one of the things with the families choosing distance learning, I have a concern with is they'll choose distance learning and then say, oh, it's not worth it. Okay, in two weeks, you're going to go back to school. Well, then maybe they're not liking that. So two weeks later, they're saying, no, we're going to distance learning. So we need to, I don't know if there's a Like you commit to a quarter, because if you're going to do distance learning, you're doing it for this first quarter, and then check or semester, and then check again after the quarter. Well, we can ask, but we cannot dictate. Right. They have that option always, and it happens with homeschooling, because a lot of people with homeschooling say, well, yeah, we'll just keep it home. No, their requirements for homeschooling is that they have to follow before they get home and go. They end up like me, Paul, uh, and they go, no, I don't want to come back. And it goes, no, I want to do this. Or I want, we have it with, with working uh, virtual academy more than anything else, I think. Because they get out of the virtual world and they go, oh, I, I thought it'd be a lot easier. So they always have that option. So there is a possibility that the family creates it if the yeah, and if you explain to them what's best for that person, it sometimes it's important either way. You know, most people say, yeah, well, okay, either you're going to school or we'll keep them home. You know, we understand that stability is important for kids. Well, and I'll add another piece to this. We will have people shopping around and say, oh, I want to be in this school district. And then go, oh, no, I want to come back. We have that now. Um, fortunately for us, which speaks well for our people here, is we have far more people that go someplace else and say, not working with anything like that. But I do think the difference is that they do have to enroll. There is some blood, sweat, tears that go into changing around. Where distance learning is just, oh, my kids going to show up tomorrow. I hope they're going to come home tomorrow. Maybe there needs to be some skin in the game with some paperwork or something that needs to be filled yeah. out to apply to the distance. Yeah, we have to be careful with it though because the uh, way the state looks at it is the parent has that ability to make that decision. But, but what she said with a form might not be a bad idea because at least the reason why, I mean, if, if you're worried about COVID or, or oh, I mean, yeah. you know, having having them put the reason why isn't a bad deal. Hell, you have to work. Yeah, um, yeah, that's kind of what I was wondering. I mean, so as an educator, I not familiar, obviously, but um, okay, so she has her normal in person class in class, you know, Monday through Friday. So, for her three students that choose to distance learn, is she going to be videotaped all day, or how you know what I mean? How is she going to relay her daily classroom? I mean, that's that's like another full day that she's going to have to. Thank you. And that's, that's the idea. It, it, it's problematic. We can do some of that to, to stream it, and then we got the problem with streaming all the time. Um, right. And then, you know, like she said, if you have a kid jump in, I mean, her Tuesday could be totally thrown apart in kindergarten. You know, when you have kids hopping around. I mean, yeah. You want, you want, yeah, you want to see Tammy's class something out? Have one student stay home. And everybody heard of coffee heavy that the day before. She will have an empty classroom and she'll be distance learning with everybody. But that's something we have to put out there. Um, we can think of it kind of like being sick for a day, but you don't have to take care of 20 of them. We've experienced this before, John. This is, this is going to be like when there's a school shooting, you know, the next 
the next board meeting in the next two months, that's all we worry about. And then the news kind of goes away. It could still happen anytime, but you know, as long as no schools are on here and it doesn't happen at Royalton, it'll kind of drift to the back. And as soon as one of the neighborhood schools or something, then it's going to be out of everybody's forefront of their mind. And it's up to us as the parents to keep our heads level and work together to get through it. So. And there is merit to what you said, though. Um, I can see a high school kid saying, I'm going to distance learn on Friday afternoon. <laughs> <laughs> Sherry? 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 I'm starting to act like the governor now with the recommendations. Well, but some of it is for the other people. <laughs> yeah, no, I agree. We strongly yeah. recommend this. Yeah. Sure. We strongly recommend this. Well, we recommend this, but we strongly recommend this. C, item D. Yeah. Or click on the site. Uh, right. Uh, I think some... it's in. Thank you. Now, one thing I'm Right now, is maybe um, I should have listening session set up um, next week, as soon as next week. Board members, um, it wouldn't have to be a board meeting because as soon as a board meeting, um, they, they, they're kind of there and maybe they want to speak. So we could just have a general listening session. To listen to concerns also and get feedback back. That's one of the things I did um, talking to kids. I talked to kids that were here. I talked with kids that were here for one thing and, and had discussions with them and did that. that. You know, what can we do to help you? That's that's a lot of mine. It goes back to what how can we help you if we just try? And there wasn't a kid I ever saw that said, I, I don't want to come back to school. I think they all want to come back. I would say too, as soon as you can get that, because that's, you know, it helped me dictate my decision on that going forward, that data you get back. So the sooner we can get that out and hopefully encourage everybody in the district to answer it, and, and you know, I'm sure like all the other board members, and obviously you guys already gave feedback, you know, or you can, so you feel free, but others, I mean, I'm totally open to hearing people's feedback because I don't know that there's a right yeah. or wrong answer it's like i like when you said we're either way we're going to get feedback so, I, i'll be willing to admit that next time we get together there's things that we thought tonight yeah, that we'll have true. different ideas about so i'll guarantee that yeah. um, new information yes mark do you have something to say so i'll make a motion to adjourn there's a motion to adjourn is there a second i'll say that's got it it was moved by Director Petron, seconded by Director Garrett to adjourn the meeting. Any discussion? I think it was a very good meeting. Thanks for coming. Any other discussion? All in favor say aye. 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 The meeting is adjourned.